Okay, uh, good morning everybody. We're going to start. The exam is over. So good job getting through that. I haven't started grading them yet. I'm going to, I'm planning on actually going home and grading all of them today. Uh, I'm just going to knock them all out today. So hopefully I can get you guys your scores back sometime over the weekend. Um, that's the plan. Um, yeah, any lingering concerns about the exam or anything we've done up until now? Okay, well, uh, today we have kind of a more exciting lesson. I, I think it's more exciting. Um, it's definitely going to be more... It's going to contain some more abstract thinking. So, uh, if you like logic and thinking, then this will be your style. If you like having the set of instructions and then executing, you might not like this as much. Um, so, we're going to start talking about something which is another topic in calculus. We're going to begin to talk about integration, uh, which I'll briefly introduce as sort of being an opposite procedure to derivation. Okay, so uh, we can sort of go down a level by taking a derivative, we can sort of go up a level by taking an integral, okay? And the integral also has a very nice interpretation in terms of the graph. So we're going to keep looking at graphs of functions, we're going to expand a little bit our understanding or rather our interpretation of some of the things we see in the graph. And, uh, and we're going to talk about functions which may themselves be... So if we have some function f, we can find some function, some other function, for which our original function is the derivative of that function. So that's where we're going. Okay, so let's start with this problem one. I think we can, we can do problem one on our own. So let's start with... A, B, and C. I'll give you guys about four minutes and we'll try this out on our own.
Do anybody like a little bit more time to keep working? Okay. Well, we'll start. We'll go through this together. So somebody help me with part A. We want to have this bicyclist traveling at a constant velocity of 15 feet per second. Person rides their bike at this speed for this amount of time. How far do they go? How can I find out how far they go? Well, velocity is distance over time. How can I manipulate this equation to just be distance? Kevin or Ellie? Yeah, we can just multiply by time to get distance, right? So if we have 15 feet per second, that's our velocity. That's distance over time. We multiply that times, so this is feet per second. We multiply that times 3 seconds, and we get 45 feet. This is like those videos you see on the internet of like the people who are like messing with their family member by asking them if I'm going 80 miles an hour. How far do I go in one hour? The answer is 80 miles, right? We just multiply by one, take away the per hour, and then we get 80, right? Okay, so that's how we do this. So now let's sketch a graph of the bicyclist velocity in feet per second as a function of time in seconds. Okay, so draw a graph. This will be time. Here's one, two, three. I'll even put a four on here just for fun. Okay, what should our velocity graph look like? Kevin? Is it just going to be a straight line? Yeah, straight line going horizontally, right? So the height of it will be 15. And our velocity curve, or more accurately, our velocity line, is just going to look like this. And then, I don't know, I guess we stop. I guess that, that second part is, is not really included in the problem, but it kind of makes sense. Actually, it doesn't make sense, because that would mean we would instantly stop going 15 feet per second. Let me erase that. All right, so this is our velocity graph. And what we now want to answer is part C, which is to say, how does this number 45 feet show up in the graph here? Anyone see the connection between this number 45 yeah because um, the velocity is feet per second yeah velocity is feet per second remember how did we get our velocity we took or our distance we took our velocity, velocity and we multiplied it by the time how does that show up geometrically in this graph here? Got an idea, Kevin? You just multiply the y value by the x value. What do we get if we take the if we take a distance if we take a distance along here and we multiply it times a distance along here, what is that going to give us geometrically speaking? The area? 
That's right, it's going to give us the area. That's what I'm trying to get at here. So this number 45 does show up in our graph here. It shows up as this area here. Okay, so that's kind of an amazing thing. All right. So the distance appeared in the velocity graph. as dot 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 the area under the curve okay we're going to say this over and over and over again as we talk about integration we're always going to be talking about the area under the curve Okay, so a little bit of abstract thinking here to try to connect this concept of this distance to the graph of something in which distance is sort of implicitly involved in our original graph, but it's not the quantity which is directly being graphed. Right? But we have all these relationships like in the derivative chapters we were talking about, well, if I see the distance graph, then I know that I can figure out what the velocity is at any given time by just checking what is the slope of the tangent line. Right? We could find out information about the velocity just by looking at the distance graph because the velocity was the rate of change of the distance. So if we just look at the slope, then that will tell us what the velocity is. Likewise, we can now look at the velocity graph, and we can come up with some other scheme as to what, how the distance is encoded in this function, which is the derivative of the distance function. Okay, that's where we're going here. All right, let's do another one. We'll do this one together. Suppose a bicyclist travels at a constant velocity of 5 feet per second for 2 seconds and then travels at a constant velocity of 15 feet per second for 1 second. How far does this bicyclist travel? What should we do here? Kind of the same process that we did in the first problem, but we got to modify it a little bit because we travel at different speeds at different times. How do I get the total distance traveled? If I go at one speed for a certain amount of time and then another speed for another amount of time, How am I going to find the total distance traveled? Emily? Yeah, very good. We're just going to find out how far we traveled over the first two seconds individually, and then we're going to find out how far we traveled over the last second, and then we add them. Right? If I drive 100 miles in the first 30 minutes of my trip, I guess I'm going really fast, and then I drive like 150 miles during the second 30 minutes of my trip. Well, over the whole first hour, I went 250 miles, right? So we're just going to take these two things and add them. So we're going to take 5 feet per second times 2 seconds plus 15 feet per second times 1 second. And we're going to get 10 feet plus 15 feet equals 25 feet.
Okay. What is going to be different about my velocity graph? Yeah, two different velocities. So how's that going to show up? What's it going to look like? So here's 5, and here's 15. How do these two different velocities show up in the graph? Is it going to look the same as before, just a straight line? No? How's it going to be different? Alice? It's going to be horizontal at 5, 15 seconds. Yep, exactly right. It's going to be horizontal at 5 for t the first two seconds. So here's 1, 2, and 3. And then it's going to be horizontal at 15 for the last second. And I don't know. We could put one of these in here. We could put a hole on the top if we wanted. It doesn't really matter too much. Okay. So before we said we can find out the uh, distance traveled by taking the area under our curve. Now the area under my curve is not exactly a nice looking shape, is it? Is there a way I can find the area underneath this curve here? Yeah, Kevin? You break them up and take the area yeah, exactly. We can break up this L shape into two rectangle shapes, okay? So let me show you with red where I'm going to draw the line between two shapes. So the L shape is really just these two shapes which are divided by this red line. On the left we have uh, this area which I'll shade in green. That's one shape. And if we kind of like blocks as kids, right, if we just put two blocks together like this, then we would get our L shape. Okay, so if I want to find out the area of this wonky looking L shape, I just have to take the area of each block and add them together. So what's that going to give me? Well, this one has height 5 and width 2. Uh, why don't I do that in green since it's the green rectangle? And then I'll add to that the area in orange, which is 15 feet high and uh, 1 second wide. And I'll get 25 again. Okay, so how does the distance you found in part A appear in the graph you sketched in part B? Again, it's the area under the curve. You might be wondering, by the way, why I keep saying area under the curve when our functions are just straight lines. Well, later on we're going to have examples of functions which aren't straight lines, right? Just like before, when we defined marginal profit and marginal cost and marginal revenue, the first thing we did was define them as the slope of a given linear cost, revenue, or profit function. Then we decided, what about if our profit function is curvy? How should we define the marginal profit then, right? So what we're doing now is we're first saying, OK, well, let's figure out how we figure out this area under the curve business for these nice flat functions. And then later on, we'll try to 
expand that understanding to a more general class of functions which are maybe more curvy. Am I recording? Oh, I am. Okay. With time t in sec, well, okay. Are there any questions about these first two problems? We took this, this graphing stuff here. Okay, all we got to do is take our velocity, multiply it times our time, and that'll give us our distance traveled. In the graph, that shows up as area if we're looking at the velocity function. Okay, any questions at all on that stuff? Fairly straightforward? Okay, let's do a more complicated one. All right, so now we've got a velocity function, which is v of t equals 5t. 5t. So things are going to get a little bit wonkier here, but don't panic. Five t looks like a line. It just goes like this. There's our velocity there. Okay, so time is on this axis, velocity is on this axis. So it means that at the start we weren't going. We were going zero miles per hour, right, or feet per second or whatever. And then as we go along, we're moving faster and faster and faster. So now what I want to do is try to figure out how far do I go in three seconds? Well, it's not going to be possible for us to use this method that we used in part uh, A of each of these two problems, where we just said, oh, well, you just take how fast you're going, multiply it times the amount of time that you go that fast, and then there you go. You've got the distance. Why can't we do that for this function? Why can't I just take my velocity and multiply it times the amount of time that I go that speed for? Exactly right. The velocity is not constant. So I can't say, you know, I was going five feet per second uh, for one second or something like that. And then so I went five feet. My velocity is constantly changing. I'm accelerating. So I can't calculate my distance traveled just by saying, well, multiply the velocity times the amount of time. What could I do instead to figure out how far I went? Yeah? Yeah, exactly. We can find the area under the curve. This time our curve is a line. We want to figure out how far do we go in these first three seconds? Well, we'll just drop a line right here. And while it's really hard to figure out the velocity or the distance traveled by doing this multiplication scheme, although there is a way to do it, uh, we can just go ahead and find the area of that green triangle. Okay, so uh, I know that the width of my green triangle, or the base, is three units wide. What about the height? I don't know the height, do I? Can I figure it out? Yeah, we can plug it into V of T to figure out how high this red line is here. So I'll plug it in, five parentheses. For T, I'm going to put in three. That's 15. Okay, so our triangle is 15 high, three wide. What's the formula for the area of a triangle? One 
yeah, one half base times height. So that's one half times three times fifteen equals forty five over two equals twenty two and a half feet. All right, sweet. So I guess we did A and B there. Questions about that one? So already we see this method kind of paying dividends. We can already compute um, we can already compute the distance traveled for a velocity function with non-constant velocity. This we're accelerating. Right, so this is already more powerful than the math involved in those internet videos about 80 miles an hour, one hour, we went 80 miles, right? It'd be a much more complicated question to say if I accelerate at a constant rate for 10 minutes, <laughs> then how fast, how much far do I go? You know, that's a much more difficult question. Okay, so let's find out a rule for finding the total distance traveled by an object with velocity function v of t between the times t equals a and t equals b. Well, how about find the area under the curve between t equals a and t equals b. So, for example, I have some velocity function like this, and uh, here's A and B. Then I just need to figure out this area under the curve. Okay, so that's, that's the rule that I think we're going to go with. All right, so now we'll have a motivating question. The motivating question is, what if the shape of our function is weird or curvy? First, we had functions which made the area under the curve break up nicely into rectangles. Rectangles are easy to find the area of. And we have one where it was a triangle, okay, a little bit more complicated, but still not too hard. We know how to find the area of a triangle. But this shape, and let me explain what I mean by shape. What I mean by shape is the shape, which is this thing here. I don't have a formula for how to find the area of a quadrilateral with a curvy side. Okay, I only know how to do straight sides. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to split the domain into n identical segments. Okay, I wrote all this out beforehand because it's a little bit painful to, to do all the drawing <laughs> live. So just let me know if you want me to slow down a little bit so you can draw or write or whatever. Okay, so this is step one. Split the domain into n identical segments. Okay, sometimes n will be maybe three or five or one million. But we're going to try to split up the domain, which is all of our x values, into these identical segments here. And then we're going to do something inside each of these segments. Does anybody have an idea of what we're going to do before I give it away? We took our curve, we split up the domain into all these segments. How could we figure out something which is maybe an approximation of this area under this curve? 
Yeah. Yeah, we're going to take the area of each segment and add them up. More specifically, we're going to approximate the area of each segment and add them up in the following way. So don't worry about this text for a second. This is what we're going to do here. We're going to take these rectangles and we're going to say, well, these rectangles are pretty close to the area in each segment. Okay, they're pretty close. All right. Now, what this text here is saying for our left rim ensemble, blah, 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 is going to tell us how should we pick the height of the rectangle. That's what it's going to tell us. So when we say a left Riemann sum, by the way, Riemann's the guy who came up with this brilliant idea. Um, when we say left Riemann sum, we're going to pick the height of the rectangle to be the height of the function on the leftmost side of the interval. OK, so let me draw your attention to this first interval highlighted in green. That's our interval. And so what we do is we try to approximate the area which I'll draw in brown here. We try to approximate this area in brown. And since we're doing a left Riemann sum, we approximate that area by just taking a rectangle where we take the height of the rectangle to be the height of the function on the left side of our green interval. Okay, that's what we're doing. So, approximate the area under the curve by adding up area of rectangles with height given by the left endpoint of each interval. Okay, so we take the area of all of these red rectangles, and that's not going to be the area under the curve, but it'll be close. Okay, similarly, for a right Riemann sum, we can just approximate the area under the curve, and the only thing we're going to change is how we pick the height of each rectangle. Instead of letting the height of each rectangle be the height of the function on the left side of the interval, we're going to let the height of the function be, or the height of the, each rectangle be the height of the function on the right side of each interval. So how does that look different? Well, it's going to look more like this. So let me see if I can get both of these on the screen at the same time. OK, so what's different is I'll draw our green rectangle in again. What's different is I approximated the brown area by taking this green rectangle where the height of the rectangle was just the height of the function on the right side of the interval. Instead of on the left side. And you can see if you look at the profile of these rectangles from the red ones to the green ones, they look a bit different. They look a bit different. One of them is going to be probably a better approximation than the other one. But we're not going to worry about which one's a better approximation or not. OK, we're not going to worry about that. I'm just telling you that these are two ways which we can do it. OK, so if the book asks you to compute the area under the curve using a left Riemann sum, you know how to choose the height of the rectangles. You should just choose the height to be the height of the function on the left side of each interval. Okay. One more thing I want to remind you of is here n equals 5 is describing the number of subintervals. Okay, so I just split up my domain into 1 2 3 4 5 equally sized rectangles. 
okay? Five equally sized rectangles. All right. So both of these sums are going to give different numbers which are going to approximate the area under the curve, okay? They're going to approximate the area under the curve. So what I'm now going to do is really quick switch gears into 5.2. And we will give the definition. Did I give it in the last one? I did. Okay, here it is. What we're now going to do is define what the heck this jazz means. Okay, this is the definition of the Riemann integral. Okay, definition of the Riemann integral. Okay, when I write this thing here, this integral sign from a to b of f of x dx, what I mean is the exact area under the curve. This is what I mean when I write this. Okay, so if this is the function f of x, when I write integral sine from a to b of f of x dx, I'm talking about the exact area under the curve from a to b. Okay, we call this the definite integral as opposed to the indefinite integral, which we'll learn about later. Okay, but don't worry about that for now. This is the definite integral. Okay. And it is defined to be the limit. Oh god, limits. We haven't really talked about limits, have we? Don't worry. Don't panic. Okay, the limit of the left and right Riemann sums as n goes to infinity. Okay. That's a lot to digest. I'll let you keep writing and then I'll give you the geometric interpretation. Okay, it's the limit of the left or the right Riemann sums, they'll agree, both limits will agree, as n goes to infinity. Now what is n? What does n represent for our Riemann sum? The number of subintervals. In other words, the number of rectangles that I'm using. Okay, so more and more rectangles are going to make this estimate better. Let's have a picture to see if you believe me. Okay, let's have this. All right, we'll do one with n equals two rectangles. Split our domain into two pieces, and we'll do a right Riemann sum this time. Just take the end point on the right, extend it over to the left. Take the end point on the right, extend it over to the left. Okay, so if I took the area of these two pink rectangles it would approximate the area under this curve. It'd be a really bad approximation because, I mean, look at all this stuff here. This, all this shaded region here is error. That's the stuff that we're messing up, right? Lots of error. Okay, what if I did this again with n equals, I don't know, we'll, we'll draw a bunch of things in here and then we'll count how many n is. Probably should have counted before. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Something like that. What if we took instead all of these rectangles?
I should have drawn this one out beforehand. Okay, I think you guys are starting to get the point, right? This is going to be a better approximation. Why will it be a better approximation? Well, look at our error. Our error on the big on the first one was all this pink shaded region. It's huge. But the error here is like not too bad. We just got a little bit here and there, right? So, if I could use an infinite number of rectangles that were unbelievably skinny, then I would have an amazing approximation of the area under the curve. Okay? So, what we do is kind of like this business that we had with, where we were uh, computing instantaneous rate of change, right? We said, okay, well, the slope, the average rate of change over one interval is like 12.5, and then it's like 12.1, and then it's like 12.01, and then it's like 12.00001, right? And we had this process going on and on, and then we said, okay, well, if we kind of think about where is this going? Well, we say it's going to the number 12, right? Same process is being used here. We do Riemann sums with more and more and more and more rectangles, and we hope that we see a pattern in the approximations of the area, and we hope that it is converging to some number, is basically how this works. Okay, how much time I got? Sweet, I got six minutes. I can do another example. Are there questions about this process or about this new definition? Yeah, Kevin? For the n equals 2 graph, mm -hmm. why wouldn't it like, kind of just cancel out? Because you're just, like, taking some extra from the top and leaving some out. You're right. You're right. It does. So I should have really drawn this as a different kind of uh, error. Here's what I'll do. So what Kevin is saying is, well, this part of the error is an over-approximation, but this part of the error is an under-approximation. So the two of those things will sort of cancel each other out a little bit, okay? Which is true. However, the difference in area between the red shape and the green shape is still significant. The red shape, I think, looks bigger much bigger, you might say, than the green one. Whereas if you take the cumulative overestimations from this graph, oh, that one was an underestimation. If you take the cumulative overestimations from this graph and you subtract from that the cumulative underestimations, Okay. If you take all of the red stuff on our left graph with n equals 2 and you subtract all the green stuff, you're still going to have a fairly large number. When you compare it to taking all of the red stuff and subtracting it from all of the green stuff on the right-hand side. So yes, that's a very good point, Kevin. You're, you're exactly right. I was a little bit careless there in my description. Any other questions? Okay, we'll talk really quickly about this problem here. We're going to use the rectangles provided on the right-hand side to estimate the integral from 0 to 4 of f of x dx. Okay, so what do we want to do? We want to use these green rectangles to estimate the true area under the curve. Okay, this is this is what we're after. The true area under the curve. So we're just going to take the area of all these rectangles and add them up. Now it looks like this one is 0.2 wide or uh, 0.2 high and 0.5 wide and this one is I don't know, point, 
6 high and 0.5 wide. This one looks like it's 2.2 high and 0.5 wide. They're all 0.5 wide. This one looks like 4 maybe. 6.2. Eight point four and twelve. So we're going to take the area of each one and add them all up. So we'll get integral from zero to four of f of x dx. We're going to do the squigglies because it's an approximation. Point two times point five plus point six times point five plus two point two times 0.5 plus 4 times 0.5 plus 6.2 times 0.5 plus 8.4 times 0.5 plus 12 times 0.5. And if we multiplied all that out and added it all up, we would get some number which is close to the true area under the curve. By the way, we could rewrite this in a smarter way. We could just write multiply 0.5, that's the width of every single rectangle, and then we'll add up all the heights of the rectangles. 0.2 plus 0.6 plus 2.2 plus 4 plus 6.2 plus 8.4 plus 12. Okay, so that is how we approximate definite integrals. It's not very elegant, <laughs> to put it lightly. It's kind of a brute force way of trying to guesstimate <laughs> the area under the curve. Next time, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can develop a more sophisticated way of computing this area under the curve using a different method. Okay? Okay, one last thing I do want to talk about here is this part down here. What is the value of n? n is the number of subintervals that I used. So if I go from 0 to 4, let's count them using pink. First subinterval was this one. It just happened to have height 0. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 subintervals. Each one was 1 half wide. Okay, I just wanted to talk about that n thing really quickly because that comes up a lot. You'll see n used all the time in the book. They're talking about the number of rectangles. Okay, that's it for today. Um, have a good weekend. If you have extra questions, stay after class, or I also have office hours today from 11 to 1. Do you have a question, Dylan? Mary? Yeah, I'll put up an exit slip. It'll be clear which one you're supposed to do. It'll say like 5.1 and 5.2. Okay. Yep. Have a good one.